Hello. Our story begins over Scarif, where the Death Star plans have been transmitted up to the fleet. Jin and Cassian spoke to each other as they prepared to descend on the base. At the same time, Admiral Radis of the Rebel fleet decided to tell his deckhands to relay those plans to the rest of the fleet. He turned back and saw the shield gate falling apart. As Radis was preparing his next stage of the attack, or even potential retreat, one of his deckhands reported that there was a massive object emerging from hyperspace. Radis turned over and looked at the massive superstructure. The Death Star was unlike anything he had seen before. The Empire did it. They constructed the ultimate super weapon. Radis believed that this weapon might target the fleet. There was no knowledge of what this weapon was capable of. Sir Radis instinctually gave the Rebel fleet a location to keep in cover as the Death Star plans were read by the pilots of the fleet. The leader of Gold Squadron, John Vandor, raided over to a squad and asked if they believed they were capable to learn these readouts if they made their move on the super weapon. Similarly, Garvin Drees did the same with his squad, while General Sundula rounded up some of the loose fighters and support ships as they made their way into the protection of the wreckage of the Shield Gate, and the two Star Destroyers too. While General Sundula rounded up some loose fighters and support ships as they made their way into the protection of the wreckage of the Shield Gate and two Star Destroyers, Vandar and Drees got confirmations from their squads as they raided back to Admiral Radis and informed him that they could make a move on the Death Star, if given permission to do so. General Sundula did the same, confirming that she could run fighter support and cover support for the group of fighters if they made such a move. There was a little bit of worry though. The Rebel fleet was decimated by this battle. They lost the entirety of Blue Squadron on the surface of the planet. When they returned to Yavin, they'd be stuck in a state of panic. Before Radis left, the Alliance seemed to be crumbling. So in his mind, if they didn't make this strike now, there wouldn't be any point in having come here to begin with. They struck the base at Scarif so they could stop the weapon that destroyed Jeddah City. Now they had their chance to fix their problems. Admiral Radis ordered Gold and Red Squadrons to move out as General Sindula followed them. They were closing in on the Death Star as the super weapon's cannon started to slowly turn around and face the base at Scarif. Admiral Radis could tell that they were going to try and destroy the Citadel on the surface, and if there were any survivors down there, they would lose them too. If they stopped the Death Star, they could potentially infiltrate the base at Scarif and get all the other information that wasn't secure with the Death Star plans. General Sundula took command over the squads as Zeb and her co-pilot C told her all the readouts as they got closer. Rex stood over her shoulder as they diagnosed where the exhaust port could be. She asked for confirmation from the two of them, as Callus ran into the room and double-checked for them. They had confirmation from three members of their squad, as Hera radioed out and told them to move to the top of the super weapon. They followed command as Zeb and Callus moved to the rear facing cannons, and Rex slid down below Hera's seat and began to operate the frontal cannons. Chopper plugged in and waited for Hera's command. Inside the Death Star, Grand Moff Tarkin was informed of the Rebel Task Force moving towards them. Tarkin was in total disbelief as he looked over with confusion. What did the rebels think they could do here? This was despicable. He told the man to dispatch their fighters and stop them. The deckhand asked Tarkin if they were still going to fire on the base. The Grand Moff looked over and told him that nothing would stop them from destroying this base and Krennic with it. Outside the Death Star, the rebel fighter squad started to climb the side of the moon-sized space station. As they did, TIE fighters sped out of their hangar base to destroy the rebels. General Sundula and the Ghost moved behind the Rebels to give them cover fire, as Callus and Zeb fired their rear cannons at them. A dogfight commenced as Garvin Drees deployed a few of his members to give support to General Sundula, who held the fighters off. At the same time, he led Gold Squadron into the trenches. They were aware that there would be turrets built into the walls. Away from the Death Star, Lord Vader's Devastator dropped out of hyperspace. His flagship opened fire, but the Star Destroyer couldn't land its shots because the Rebel fleet was hidden within the wreckage of the Shield Gate and Imperial Defense Fleet. Admiral Radis could tell that they couldn't go toe-to-toe -to -toe with this vessel. Their shields were too badly damaged, and one of their greatest strengths were gone, because all the fighters were attacking the Death Star. Radis turned to his deckhand and told them to disperse the fleet past the Death Star. It appeared they didn't have any intention of fighting their fleet. If they could get around the superstructure, they could get open for a retreat away from the Star Destroyer. Radis's flagship prepared for a fighting retreat as the tanky Star Destroyer moved in, trying to keep within firing range of the Rebel fleet. While this chase was beginning, Gold Squadron missed their initial strike by going down the wrong trench and bombing a hallway, detonating a couple stormtroopers on their basic patrol. General Sundula broke out of the trenches and assisted a few remaining members of Red Squadron as John Vander flew over their trench and down into the next one. With the ties kept at bay, Gold Squadron made a run on the exhaust port. They were avoiding shots by the turrets on the side of the walls. John followed down, leading the rest of Red Squadron on a backup run, just in case this was a strike they needed to make. 
General Sundula dispatched the other members of Red Squadron to follow behind them as she followed them into the trenches. The fighters came across the exhaust port and began activating the targeting computers. Inside the Tanta 4, Princess Leia Organa was waiting for the all-clear signal. She had the Death Star plans just in case they needed to escape. She planned on going to retrieve Obi-Wan Kenobi, but if they could win here, then there'd be no need to go and find her longtime friend. Leia kept her eyes on the hologram of the battle map as the flagship rattled. Despite keeping as far out of range as they could, Radis' flagship was getting berated from behind, with his full rear shields open. Radis made sure that every other ship in the fleet stayed out of the way. Inside the trenches of the Death Star, the Rebels pushed further and further. Thanks to the Ghost, the tires weren't able to get anywhere close to the Rebel bombers and X-Wings. The Ghost was blocking every strike coming for the Rebels. Didn't matter if tires were trying to go over the Ghost or if the tires were trying to shoot down the vessel. Hera, despite the tiny room she was working with, avoided these strikes by spinning the ship around. While she was only here to keep the X-Wings and Y-Wings protected, Gold Squadron radioed over and told them that they missed their strike. The X-Wings of Red Squadron were up and their bombs deployed and missed their shot too. The two wings of fighters dispersed as they tried to come back around for another strike. Hera, who was solely focused on fending off the fighters, had to switch back into bombing mindset. She pulled down her targeting computer as Rex called up to her and told her where the best position to line up would be. She heard this, but she was focused in on her run. Chopper communicated to her, telling her that they only had one torpedo to work with. Hera didn't respond to anyone, as she pushed the throttle in. Callus and Zeb kept pressure off her from the backside, as she locked in and pressed her hands along the trigger squeezer. They closed in and she could feel her heart rate rise. This was for the Rebellion, for the galaxy, for Kanan, Ezra, and everyone. If she missed this, it could undo their entire assault at Scarif. But none of these thoughts came to her mind. Focus filled her body and she slowed down her breath and held it. Hera pulled the trigger and spun the ship upside down before pulling out of the trenches. Callus and the top cannon called down to her, telling her that the shot was made. The rebels pulled away and moved out as John Vander told Admiral Radis that they landed their shot. The Admiral of the fleet was grateful as he told the deckhands to focus all their power on the rear shields and the engines. They asked why and he told them that they didn't need their weapon systems. They needed to get out of the way. The rebel squadron sped away from the superstructure. Tarkin had been waiting for the weapon to pull around and face the base at Scarif, and as they prepared the single reactor for ignition, the Death Star detonated. Due to the Devastator following the Rebel fleet, it was clipped by the destruction of the Death Star, rattling the entire Star Destroyer. Radis could tell that that Star Destroyer was struggling and disabled, and so with the Death Star explosion consuming half of Vader's flagship, the Rebel fleet turned all the way back around and opened fire on the Star Destroyer. Hera and the Rebel fighters moved down towards the Rebel fleet as they sped past a Nebulon B frigate and over the Profinity MC-75. Vader stood on the bridge with confusion, as the Rebels unloaded their remaining firepower into the Imperial vessel. On the surface, Director Krennic watched as the Death Star, the pride of his entire lifetime, was destroyed. He was outraged. That full Tarkin and his inflated ego brought the Death Star to a battleground. He could take responsibility for this, but he wouldn't. Tarkin brought the Death Star here, not him. A group of stormtroopers came around to the top and found Krennic on the ground. He turned over and they helped him up, telling him they needed to go. Krennic told them to get him on a transport and take him back to Coruscant. At the same time, Rebel dropships moved from the Rebel fleet down to the surface of the planet. The Rebel fighters, led by Hera Syndulla, Garvin Drees, and John Vander, led an attack on the bridge of the Star Destroyer. Vader watched in pure confusion. How could the Rebels have won so quickly? And as he watched them get closer, he was destroyed by an explosion that detonated the bridge of his Devastator. The ship continued to limp even without a bridge, but it was within the pool of Scarif's gravitational pull, and was pulled down. While it slipped to the surface, Krennic's shuttle lifted off and moved through the atmosphere, narrowly avoiding Rebel ground transports going to rescue Rogue One. But there was a tragedy. The only survivors of the battle were Jin Erso, Cassian Andor, and a few other Rebels scattered across the base. The Rebels had won the battle, but the cost was horrid. On the other hand, the Rebels that evacuated Rogue One had a chance to try and get inside the Citadel. As Rogue One was lifted away from the surface, there was a problem. The Devastator drifted through the atmosphere and was speeding down towards the Citadel Tower. The rebels inside of it were forced to evacuate before being able to get any of the information out of the archives. They narrowly avoided the Star Destroyer as it slammed down into the base, destroying any chance for the rebels to secure any information. With victory and the loss of the archived information, the rebels limped away back to their home base at Yavin 4. The greatest victory in all of this was their survival and the fact that the Yavin base was still undiscovered. With the Rebels eventually returning to their base, Director Krennic arrived outside of Coruscant and requested time to speak with his eminence, Emperor Palpatine. 
Krennic was granted permission as he landed and quickly ran to his office. The wound on his torso was still visible, but he was fighting through it. Krennic entered the office and slouched. Despite the wound being visible, there were bandages on it. Palpatine could see how dirty the typically presentable director was, and he waited for him to speak. Krennic told him that the rebels attacked Scarif, and he stopped them. The shield gate was closed up, and he stopped the rebels from escaping. While he was on the surface, Tarkin showed up, and the rebels made a counter move against the Death Star, after destroying the shield gate. Palpatine's gaze tightened, as he showed visible frustration with the situation. He felt the change in the Force, but what he was about to learn would change everything. The Death Star, aside from being a super station, was a massive space station. Palpatine would need to explain why millions of people were now dead, and what happened over Scarif. It was a terribly exhaustive situation, one that would need lots of explaining. Palpatine wanted to be angry at Krennic, and truthfully, he was moments away from force choking the Imperial Director, but he decided against it. Palpatine leaned back and told his director that there were two roads for him to go down. The loss of the Death Star at Scarif and the Citadel would need extensive cover-up, so Krennic had a chance to either join Palpatine in this cover-up as a newly appointed Grand Moff, or he could find himself at the bottom of a trash bin like Tarkin and his foolish administrators. Krennic chose the obvious option. He wanted power, and this was his chance. Due to the fact that a number of admirals, generals, and even a representative from the ISB were going to go to the Death Star, they'd have to put that on hold for the time being. Palpatine would need to scramble control for a political war against the rebel insurgents. He tasked Krennic, as the original director of Stardust Initiative, to run a smear campaign against the rebels. Since the Death Star had no official name other than Stardust, and no one knew what his purpose was, they needed to give people a reason to see these rebels as traitors. Krennic understood and swiftly left, getting stitched up on Coruscant and coming up with a plan. All the previously mentioned ranked individuals would be gathered for Krennic to disclose his smear campaign to. And since Krennic was promoted to Grand Moff, all the other Moffs around the galaxy were also being brought to Coruscant for this discussion. In the meantime, as he waited for this plan, Palpatine prepared his own countermeasure. He dispatched more fleets from the core to the mid and outer rim to find and destroy those rebels. Their fleet had been identified, and it was time that they were dealt with. Due to the mining disaster on Jeddah being told to the Senate as just that, Palpatine would need to once again address the Senate. What he was unprepared for was the countermeasures created by Alliance loyal senators. Bail Organa, Mon Mothma, and Pommel Voice were all members of the Alliance who were a part of the Imperial Senate. With holograms of the Death Star readout, images of the weapon before the attack, and the readouts of the powering up of its superweapon tracked by the Rebel flagship, they had their own move to make. The three of them quickly returned to Coruscant after retaining this information. Krennic, on the other hand, prepared everything he needed, and after coming up with an idea, he went directly to a meeting with the top leaders from across the Empire. He spoke with proper etiquette, and didn't slander Tarkin. He told them that the project named Stardust was a space station designed for the integration of the Outer Rim into the Empire, similar in attention to the ancient space station called Starlight Beacon. The Imperial Minds looked to each other. All of them had heard rumors that Stardust was a super weapon. Krennic paced around, his cape flowing behind him, as his new pin of Grand Moth shined glamorously under the overhead lights. He told them that the Emperor wanted to bring unity to the galaxy. After 19 years of strength and prosperity under the Empire, it was his plan to unveil the- He paused, almost mixing up the names. It was Palpatine's plan to unveil Stardust on Empire Day. It would be 19 years since the fall of the Republic, and it would be the perfect way to disclose the power of the Empire. While Stardust was a superstation, one that, while yes, had a military presence, it was also one intended for the people of the galaxy. Since Stardust could travel through hyperspace, it was a perfect way to maximize the effectiveness that Starlight Beacon failed at. Starlight of the past was meant to be multiplied, spread out across the frontier as multiple stations, but with Stardust, the Empire could have gone to different systems, taken control, freed their people, and allowed them to bring their culture on board the station. It could have been a cultural hub of people across the galaxy to partake in, especially because it was so much larger than Starlight. The people here had heard of this project. Tarkin did speak of it, but he always had a much more icy tone about things, like Stardust was meant to be a weapon that could exterminate the rebels, but Krennic, now having cleared up the air, made it clear that it was used to keep the local systems in unison, not in check. Krennic and his council gave Palpatine all their information, and Krennic also told the Emperor everything he had relayed to the council. Palpatine was very surprised, but Krennic had the gift of knowledge, which he used to extensively cover up the true meaning of Stardust. 
Of course, the Citadel on Scarif was nothing more than a research facility, not an archive database. The Empire was protecting it because there were worries of kaiju monsters on the planet, similar to the Zillow beast that attacked Coruscant during the Clone Wars. Both of these were fantastic ways to cover up the Death Star and the Citadel at Scarif. With everything ready, Palpatine told Krennic to bring himself to the Senate building so he could address the Senate. As both sides of the war were preparing for their initiative to tear down the establishment of the Alliance, or the Empire, Admiral Radis was moving out again. Due to his ship needing repairs, he went to his home world and was able to receive repairs from some good allies. He was able to also get into inner circles and begin speaking with his allies from the water world. The Mon Cala were against the Empire, and with an extra incentive, thanks to Radis, he returned to Yavin with a couple more MC-type ships. There were variants in the Alliance Navy, but most of them were hidden in the Outer Rim. This officially made the Scarif fleet the largest fleet in the Alliance Navy. It was something to behold for the Rebels as they licked their wounds on their home base. Princess Leia Organa, with instruction from her father, was sent out to another mid-rim world to try and garner allies. She was able to do this with other Alliance leaders and representatives, doing the same because the galaxy was turning his attention towards the Senate. With everything unfolding at Jeddah and the Emperor calling for an emergency session, people were ready to listen in, especially because no one believed that the incident at Jeddah was a mining disaster. News outlets were covering the damage. It was worse than the hyperspace disaster of 232 BBY. As the Senate gathered up, Krennic stood in the same position as Admiral Rampart did 18 years beforehand. The Empire was on the brink of exposure, and it was his job to cover it up. Krennic believed he did well, but Palpatine was always ready with a backup plan. They knew the Rebels would try to seize this opportunity. When it began, Palpatine addressed everything as he did normally. He then dove into why they were here, addressing that following the mining disaster, there was a rebel attack at a hidden base on Scarif, believing that these were connected. He brought the director of the Scarif Institution to Coruscant to disclose these findings and what happened. Krennic's pod lifted up into the main chambers as he spoke eerily to the Senate. He told them that he was director of the project called Stardust. It had been his honor to work with the late great Galen Erso on the project for the last decade or so. After the Rebels bombed an Imperial research facility, they targeted one at Scarif. It just so happened to be that an Imperial space station for enlightenment was destroyed there. Just as he had with the Imperial Council, he told the Senate, and they were outraged. Just as Krennic was finishing up, the Rebels came forward. Mon Mothma took the first stand, with Bale and Palmo following her up. She exposed that there were individuals who informed them that these were all lies. The Death Star, despite Krennic calling it Stardust, was a super weapon that detonated the ancient city of Jeddah. She and Bale used holograms to show everyone within the Senate what had happened at the ancient city, and what the weapon actually looked like, including the energy readouts from the Rebel flagship during the Battle Scarif. Aside from the fact that they had information given to them from an unknown source, they spoke with hearts of gold. They cultivated the minds of a beat-down Senate, a system of government that hadn't had a true voice in over a decade. Mun, Palmo, and Bale spoke to the people, telling them that they had a chance to finally make a right of the wrong in the galaxy. Palpatine and his loyal dogs were lying to the people. No mining disaster in the history of mining disasters could do that, using examples of coaxium mines on Kessel, and how despite them having mining disasters every four or five months, nothing ever destroyed their planet, not to mention Kessel was under imperial supervision. The body of government was moved, until Grand Moff Krennic, who could feel Palpatine's gaze on him, spoke up. Orson told the Senate that these were all lies from individuals who claimed to be spokespeople for the people of the galaxy, but they were representing a group of insurgents, people who terrorized the Empire. Stardust would have been a cultural hub for the people of the galaxy, and they were supporting its destruction. The members of the Senate spoke out, demanding to know what was powering up, or what the larger circular dish was. Krennic didn't even hesitate. The superstation was powering up its hyperdrive. He asked them if they understood what a hyperdrive on a starfighter was like, or a hyperdrive on a luxury cruiser. Krennic pointed, asking inquisitively because they should know. They take their luxury cruises across the galaxy and the core, no? Then if the senator who asked this boisterous question couldn't imagine how large the hyperdrive on a luxury cruiser was, mind you, one smaller than an Imperial Arquintans class cruiser, then how large did they think the hyperdrive on Stardust was? It was a massive vessel, one the size of a moon, one powered by kyber crystals just to move. 
Someone asked about the crystals, to which Krennic responded, giving them some ludicrous answer about everything Galen Ursa designed on Edu. He then switched back to the original question, telling them about the massive dish in the middle. He told them that it was a satellite dish, one that was designed to help the Empire communicate from the outer rim to the core with no troubles. He didn't stop there, expressing that Galen, before his death, had hopes that the Empire could expand far beyond the known galaxy. Stardust could have led to an era of expansion not seen since the formation of the Old Republic, but those dreams were now dead. Krennic's voice lowered as he acted sad, before he switched back to a condescending voice. He called to the Emperor and asked that they make an example of these rebel sympathizers. If they wanted to support egregious actions of a few lunatics who killed millions of draftees, then they should face public execution. The Senate erupted into conversation, and at the end of it, Palpatine, with backing from the majority of the Senate, agreed to have them executed. The public demonstration would come in the next 24 hours, where a stormtrooper captain would stand before the crowd and guillotine the traitors to the Empire. And just like that, Palpatine decided that the Senate was far too valuable to give up. While there were individuals who were rightly upset about the secrecy of this project, Krennic delivered another public statement, telling the people that the Imperial leadership that had been in control over Stardust wanted to keep it a secret. Due to how expensive Starlight was 200 years before, and how even more expensive this was 200 years later, they didn't want the Rebels to find it or know about it. The tragedy was the fact that they were able to locate it before they could safely escort the vessel to Coruscant for Empire Day. Leia horrifically had to watch her father get executed on air, and it broke her heart. She wanted to save him, but she knew that if she got involved, she could risk everything. The Alliance was crushed by this. Three of the most influential voices had been wiped out, and without the information from the Citadel at Scarif, they had no other information to work with. At Yavin, with Hera out due to having her first child, the Rebels were searching for leadership. Newly appointed Commander Cassian Andor suggested that they unify what had been lost before Scarif. The Rebels needed to gather a new leadership. Cassian suggested Radis and Hera for the roles of command over the Alliance forces. They were both in control of themselves to maintain composure not just during combat, but in leadership. Cassian's notions were supported by other members of the Alliance High Command. Without their original leaders, they had to ride off the high from the Battle of Scarif. That victory would redefine their war effort, though. Despite the Alliance feeling like they had a chance to actually pull together a fully-fledged rebellion, their support in the Corps died out. Without the detonation of Alderaan, there wasn't really a reality check for Imperial citizens. The Senate, for the first time in perhaps years, finally rallied behind their Emperor unanimously, and with the Rebels appearing to be a chaotic force, propaganda was rolled out to make them look like monsters. The war with the Alliance, as Palpatine realized, needed to be won on a political level. If the Empire could not win the war politically, then they would struggle to keep composure and loyalty if the Rebels won in unorthodox scenarios. Krennic, after having watched what the Rebels were capable of at Edu and Scarif, realized that they needed to legitimately take them as a threat. He brought his concerns to Palpatine, who told them that they could not legitimize these radicals. They were insurgents, and they couldn't be taken as a real threat. Krennic understood the political implications of this, but it would be foolish to assume that these rebels weren't a threat. He told Palpatine that the Empire needed to focus on its fighter support. Understanding, especially as one of Palpatine's closest allies, that there was a project that lost out to the Death Star before the battle at Lothal. Krennic requested permission to return to the producing of the TIE Defender model fighter. Krennic also made a point about the second Death Star being a waste of their credits. Palpatine approved of Krennic's suggestions. The Rebels and the Empire continued their war on the ground, while the political landscape continued to prosper off of it. Once she recovered from giving birth, Hera rejoined the fight to assist her Rebels, but the biggest struggle was the political war. Even without Jedi or Force-sensitive farm boys joining their ranks, they maintained a fight with the Empire. The issue was, they lacked political support. The grudge match with the Empire became a stalemate. For months, this continued, with the Rebels attempting to gain any sense of public support but failing at each turn. The Senate was revitalized in the Palpatine's puppet machine, and Krennic was closing in on a revamped model of the TIE Defender at Kuat. The Alliance was still strong on Yavin, and despite the lack of public appeal they had, they were able to gain more reinforcements from freedom fighters who hated the Empire. An aid that came to the Alliance was in the form of Hondo Anaka. He was a longtime semi-ally of Harrison Dula. What Hondo found were these old storm seeds. They were semi-operational, but he figured he'd sell them to the Alliance for a cheap price because they'd always been kind to him. The Alliance eventually bought his entire supply of storm seeds and layered them around Yavin as a preemptive defense. They had extras that they didn't use and kept them hidden inside of their flagships. Essentially, these storm seeds were devices created during the Age of the Republic. 
They were used to destroy objects traveling through hyperspace. The initial gravity well station designer brought these monstrosities to life. There was very little belief that these would work, but the Rebellion was willing to try it, because they needed to, but especially since their fleet would never go out the way an Imperial fleet would come in. Due to this, they obviously had to make it clear to anyone traveling to Yavin that they needed to avoid this specific route. The war with the Empire had gone poorly in the public spotlight. While they were still winning and General Sundula as well as Admiral Radis were the perfect leaders for their cause, it was still an uphill battle that felt unconquerable. The Alliance was fighting a force that actually started to take them as a legitimate threat, and Krennic's revamped TIE Defenders were closing in on finishing their production. The Rebels learned of the TIE Defender a few weeks before the Empire learned of the Yavin base. Hera warned the Rebels that they needed to make a move, and they agreed, but they couldn't attack deep into the core. The TIE Defenders, instead of being built in the Outer Rim territories like Lethal, were built in the core. As the Alliance was preparing for their commander raid on the TIE Defender factory, they were attacked by an Imperial fleet, one sent by Grand Moff Krennic, with the blessing of course from Emperor Palpatine. The Imperial fleet before entering the Yavin system was shredded by the Storm Seeds. It didn't matter what ship was brought, if it was a Star Destroyer support ship or something else, it was caught in explosions and detonated, especially since these ships didn't travel with their shields on during hyperspace travel. The Rebels were completely unprepared for it, but it proved to them that these weapons could be perfect for their cause. The Storm Seeds completely destroyed the Imperial fleet that tried to attack Yavin. There were a couple surviving vessels which were dealt with, but it proved to the Rebels that they had a gold mine on their hands. They tasked Honda with finding more Storm Seeds as the Rebels, under the direction of General Sundula, relocated their forces to the base at Crate. It was a little deeper into the Outer Rim, but if the Empire wanted to chase them down, then they'd have to pay for it. This move would be brilliant, because when Imperial reinforcements arrived at Yavin, they found that the Rebels had abandoned posts and they seemingly destroyed an entire Imperial attack force without suffering a single casualty. It was decided by an Outer Rim Moth to spout this information to the public. He believed that in doing so, the public would see how dangerous the Rebels were, but instead it showed how weak the Empire was. If the Rebels could destroy an entire military fleet, then what was the point of an Imperial military? Its navy must have been built out of logs if they couldn't destroy what, one vessel? There weren't even signs of a single starfighter being destroyed. Krennic had this moth killed in his sleep for having relayed such information without his approval. Krennic became Palpatine's right-hand man, and while he did want an apprentice, the truth is, Palpatine never really cared for the rule of two nonsense. He had his power and he knew how he'd keep it. With Necromancer underway at Exegol, there was nothing stopping him from an eternal empire. Krennic made a public speech to reassure the people's faith in the Imperial military complex. Despite the loss at Yavin, it did help the people with their trust in the military. Though the rebels wanted to create more instability. Knowing that the TIE Defender was a large project the Empire was working on, it became clear that the rebels had one clear enemy. Destroying those vessels would be the key to winning this war. Not the political one, but the physical one. General Syndulla proposed a means to end this war. The rebels had been infiltrating the Senate and the Empire. There was a close advisor to a moth in the Imperial Corps, as well as royal guards that worked for Palpatine that were actually rebels. Due to the fact that the Senate couldn't be changed, they needed to force the Senate to change. Krennic was excitingly telling Palpatine about the project on Kuat, and how they were going to finish it. They planned to show him a demo by the end of the week, and Palpatine told him he wanted to be there. Due to the fact that the war was a stalemate, the Emperor was looking for a way to find victory and continue forward with his own plans. Palpatine told his trusted ally that he would be there. Krennic had since Scarif filled the role of Palpatine's second in command, and he hadn't tried to get any more power than that. Krennic was pleased with his new role, and he believed that right here, he could continue. In the back of his mind, he had aspirations for the role of Emperor, but only when Palpatine naturally passed away. Until then, he would loyally serve. The Alliance moved its main fleet, the one from Yavin and Crate, into the between space outside of the hyperspace lane. They were on the route from Coruscant to Kuat, and they laid their traps. They had to be careful though. Hondo hadn't found any new storm seeds, and they had to activate these weapons right before Palpatine got to the location. If not, they could kill innocent civilians traveling on the hyperspace lane. Palpatine was traveling inside of his new starship. It wasn't fully finished, but it was a powerhouse. It had light shields and all of its weapons. As the first super star destroyer of the Imperial Navy, there were a few quirks they had to work out. But the super vessel was protected by a support fleet. The rebel fleet waited. A strike force of capital ships were prepared and General Syndulla held the trigger. Inside the bridge of the Super Star Destroyer, 
One of the rogue guards held his pike and pressed his thumb up against the sensor that would have led the rebels to the presence of Palpatine's fleet. Sidious felt the change as they were getting closer to the trap, and he turned around and killed both of his rogue guards, even the non-rebel one, just to be safe. When they fell, the one guard's hand, the one who was actually a rebel, still fell onto the trigger device as Palpatine turned back to see explosions radiate in front of them and rip the entire Imperial fleet from hyperspace. Star Destroyers were pulled into each other upon exit from hyperspace as a barrage of fire rained down on their fleet. The support vessels were torn to pieces and the Executor opened up their light shields. Due to the hyperspace travel, their shields weren't activated, and they had to power up the shields on the super vessel. Despite a number of Imperial destroyers being wiped off the battle map, there were still a few that remained. Hera led the fighters into an assault, as Admiral Raddus commanded the capital ships to target the massive super ship. The battle kicked off into a fiery ray of chaos. Palpatine's flagship stood strong. Due to its full weapons being operational, its weapons shredded the shields of the rebels. Syndulla's fighters sped towards the destroyers, tearing through the surface cannons and disabling the weapons they had available, essentially making the surviving Star Destroyers floating triangles with no shields or weapons. As they were doing this, Y-Wing squads were making bombing runs against the Executor, but due to the amount of weapons, it was impossible to penetrate. Even with the full array of Rebel flagships fending off the Super Destroyer, they could only barely break through its light shields. This allowed the captain on deck to focus all the firepower against the Rebel forces. Hera and her fighters were caught in gridlock with ties, and the surface cannons of the Executor, so they couldn't actually get anywhere close to the bridge of the ship. Due to the fighter support completely stopping for the Rebels, the Rebel capital ship started detonating. An MC-80 on the port side of the profundity exploded, sending the breeze out into the hull of nearby ships. Due to the makeup of the Rebel fleet, their support ships were starting to get crushed. General Syndulla tried to get the fighters to counter the Executor, but unlike the Death Star, it was much harder. Their surface cannons were higher up, and they didn't have a full trench to run. There were slots they could climb through, but only an experienced fighter could do that, and the ghost was too large. The chaos only continued to mount up as the Executor poured firepower into the other capital ships of the Rebel fleet. A wing of X-Wings broke off from the gridlock as they tried to make their way to the bridge. John Vander led the group of X-Wings as General Syndulla tried to hold up the ties that tried to cut them down, but she couldn't even stop all of them. Vander slid between the edges of the Executor as the unskilled pilots took the top route, locking their torpedoes and firing them at the bridge. Thanks to point defense systems, these rockets were blown out of the sky before ever reaching it. A group of A-Wings tried to squeeze in, but only half of them did, as the Rebels watched their hard-earned fleet detonate from around them. Sidious on the bridge walked to the edge and smiled with glee. This was the end of the Rebellion. Their largest cell was being completely destroyed. He turned back to the captain and told him to inform Grand Moff Krennic that there'd be no need for TIE Defenders. They could focus on more TIEs and Super Destroyers. Palpatine turned back to his throne room, and just as he turned around, John Vander's X-Wing clipped the edge of the wall, and his left thruster was blown up by an ace TIE pilot. He screamed out bloody murder as the TIE pilot was blown into oblivion by another X-Wing. Vander pulled his own X-Wing out of the small trench, and as he looked forward, he screamed, going into the bridge of the Executor, detonating himself, the bridge, and the Emperor in one huge accident. Tragically, Vander had been trying to pull straight up, but the blown out thruster forced him into the bridge. The explosion killed them all, completely catching Sidious off guard before he could do anything about immortality, and within an instant, the Executor started to lose control. As the ship began sinking, the Rebels limped around the massive weapon, blowing out its engines and allowing it to implode upon itself due to the reactor exploding. The Rebels escaped back to Crate after their victory with sizable losses. Krennic would be disenchanted with the loss they incurred, but the Empire was strong, with or without Palpatine. He would continue forward with the TIE Defender project, after the test had gone well. It wasn't perfect, but he had enough support from Imperial personnel that allowed him to continue the project as he returned to Coruscant. Despite the Rebels winning, they were still painted as insurgents. As for a certain Luke Skywalker, who after spending another year on his uncle's farm, was able to join the military. However, he was followed by that old hermit from the desert, and after some attempts at teaching the Force to him, Luke found a way far away from Kenobi. Not that Obi-Wan was bad, but it was weird to Luke. He came to be a pilot, not a monk or whatever. There was of course the fact that Luke was angry at Ben and his uncle and aunt. Ben revealed that Leia was his sister, and that led to a whole range of emotions. In the long end of the story, Luke had no interest in becoming a Jedi, and completely forsake old Ben and the Jedi way. The Empire responded to the tragedy with ramping up its military movements, hoping to squeeze the Rebellion out of existence, and instead of doing that, they reverted to a pre-Scarif burn. No matter how popular Krennic was, he never won a vote from the Senate, because he wasn't one of them. 
He was an outsider, Imperial Moth, only in for the money. The Senate wasn't having it. So even though they supported his TIE Defender project, which did eventually get rolled out, it didn't make a great deal of change. The TIE Defender, despite its effectiveness under Thrawn, had his issues. Krennic was a great mind, but he was the big picture person. Thrawn was meticulous, so while Krennic's designs were on par, there were some budget cuts that were out of his control that removed key features for the TIE Defender, making it weaker. Krennic's engineers reassured him that everything would be fine, but they weren't. Despite the Battle of Scarif buying the Empire a time of unity, the war that followed Palpatine's death would be gritty. The Empire cracked down and people responded. The Alliance used its strong base to fortify a push into the Mid-Rim, but without real Jedi or Sith in a war, the fight became just that, gritty. Thanks to Commander Andor and Captain Urso leading Commander raids, the internal Imperial Circle continued to shrink, and because the Senate, despite popularity from the public for Krennic, didn't understand how to combat this. The Senate kept replacing these moths and admirals with people that hated each other, and eventually, after six years of long-fought combat, the Senate had erased Palpatine's power and impact in the post-Scarif era. The Senate did try to correct their wronging, but it was too late. Krennic would be the last face of a golden era of imperialism. He would be a part of the final battle in the war, but his placement at the top of the Empire was the culmination of his life's work, thrown off by a simple accident. The death of Palpatine didn't lead to contingency orders, due to Krennic stopping them from ever demoralizing the Imperial public, which did help the Empire keep his popularity for so long. The Senate just continued to neglect him because he was a moth, and they thought he would focus on taking their credits rather than winning the war, which ironically was just the opposite of them. In their greed, they surrendered the Empire to a unified alliance that was not full of greed. Due to the early success of the Storm Seeds, they became more commonplace for the Alliance during the war that followed. The Empire kind of looked down on it as a barbaric way of combat, and they stuck to their interdictors and gravity well generators. But they didn't pack a punch like Storm Seeds did. The Rebellion kept modifying them too. After the Executor almost destroyed their entire fleet, they made sure that these Storm Seeds could actually destroy something as large as a Super Destroyer. The war itself came down to a six month siege on Coruscant. One that after hundreds of Imperial officers, moths, and generals had been killed by Cassian-led commando missions. The commandos of Rogue One and the Senate's greed were the key to winning the war against the Empire. It just took the Imperial Senate, the very Senate that Palpatine was hours away from disbanding, to undo a millennium of Sith planning. The post-war era wouldn't be one of demilitarization. The Empire didn't vanish after Coruscant. Instead, the moths who hated each other found new allies and created separate alliances. Some of them tried to get the throne, while others focused on their fight against the reborn democracy. The skirmishes following the eight-year Galactic Civil War would last another three years, and at the end, the Empire would be nothing but shambles. The final order would be a fleet without a leader, and the long-established religions of Jedi and Sith would be gone forever. At some point, generations after the war, they might be rediscovered again, but heroes of the war, such as Luke and Leia, would strengthen their bond as siblings and find connection with the people in the new era of the Republic. And that, my friends, is our story. Again, special thanks to our patrons, Benjamin Wells, Ozpin, Angel Dust, Alexandra Reese, The Beginning and End, Django Fett Clone, Nick5098, IMTJ Recluse, Ben Ingram, The Big Red Pure Mark, Diamond Constant, Darth Nemesis, Lord Tibbs, CC2024, Galavik Gaming, Tristan, Mandalore, Sir William1767, Darth Revan, Granity Bane, Laliant, Sky Guy, Penguin, Cullen Rooney, Shark Midori, RJ38, Nick, Michael Erlanger, The Last Jedi, Apollo, Wee Was 670 Annika Shank Runner, CT7567, Toaster Oven, Oz of Oz, Darth Knox, The Eternal Padawan, Joshua Tam, John Nguyen, Sansa Skeleton, Jedi Sloth, Mr. Yeet Gamer, Lord Cali, Galaxy 66, Mamino Studios, Anakin 003, Lord Draken, Photos Legacy Star Wars, Airbus, Rex the Wolf, The Man Three First Names, Dark Saint 46, Baron Joshua, and Lord Deadwing. Force Born Channel, smash that like button. Let's talk about this story. So I really kind of wanted to go with the idea that Scarif as a victory would be really negative for the Alliance. Like they would win the battle, but politically they wouldn't have the support to go the distance. I really wanted to play with the uh, political aspect of the Imperial or the Galactic Civil War era because pretty much everything after, I guess, Season 1 of Andor doesn't really have anything too political, maybe some rebel stuff, but there's not a whole lot of Galactic Civil War politics and I kind of wanted to include that here. And I feel like the irony of Palpatine keeping the Senate alive is kind of what his undoing or the undoing of his empire is. I liked kind of incorporating different elements of the High Republic into this because I felt like it's kind of different in this era. The Storm Seeds and of course relating Stardust to Starlight I thought was kind of cool as well. Making the Empire seem really caring, like they actually credit Stardust for the people and all that stuff. So 
I hope you all enjoy this story. I love you all. Spread the love. And always remember, my friends, may the Force be with you. Thank <laughs> you.